Welcome to the Made to Parade podcast, sponsored by the British Drum Company, manufacturers of the Phantom, Regimental Series and Axial Parade drums that look amazing, sound amazing and feel amazing. Alrighty, folks, welcome along to another episode of the, the Made to Parade podcast. This is a special bonus episode on season number five. One of the things that we, we do a lot on the podcast is talk about the positive aspects of what bands do and especially around some of the charity work that they do and how they help other people out. And we have a guest with us today who's going to talk about an issue that's that's very important and it's something that the members of the band scene potentially get involved in and help people out. So I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Catherine Schofield, who is the Senior Lecturer of South Asian Music and History in King's College in London to talk about this particular issue. So I'm going to bring her in now and we're going to have a wee bit of a conversation about um, this particular issue as well. So here we go. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? You all right? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Well, yeah, yeah, I can't complain much. So that's so um, all good. Listen, absolutely delighted, Catherine, to have you on the, the podcast with us there. And uh, and a big thank you to Darren from Beyond Skin for making the introductions and so on. So uh, maybe, a good, maybe a good place for us to start is just for maybe you to introduce yourself and tell us maybe a wee bit about who you are. And then we'll delve into other things as we go along. Sure. Well, I'm um, I'm Catherine Schofield. I uh, come from a fiddle playing background. The reason I started out in music was because my dad wanted a fiddle player for his folk band. Um, <laughs> and so at the age of seven, I started having violin lessons. Um, so okay. I grew up playing um, Irish and Scottish jigs and reels and uh, singing uh four-part harmony with my family in okay. country, country clubs in Australia. So, uh-huh. <laughs> so that's where I came from. But uh, but yes, um, yeah, South Asian music and history, that's something that uh, crept up on me uh, in my undergraduate and uh, days. Um, right. So I went to conservatoire to play the violin, as you do, uh-huh. uh, in Australia. And, um, uh-huh. and I got bored. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got bored. So, so I got really interested in um, Indian classical music because right. um, it's this improvised form, which is incredibly virtuosic. I don't know if any of you have heard sitar players or tabla players, yeah, yeah. Um, or you know any anything like that. I mean, it's amazingly virtuosic, and um, and the best thing for me about it was it that it was the performer who was basically the composer. Um, it's the performer who creates the sound and the music. And I just found this really compelling. Um, right. And I also um, knew that I didn't, I didn't want to um, continue as a, as a, you know, professional performer. I had a job in an orchestra, which I really hated. Uh-huh. Um, nice. And um, <laughs> yeah, I hated it because it was really stressful and because there was just nothing intellectually stimulating about it um, uh-huh. for, 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 you know, at this point, I'd switch to viola. So, you know, you can make all the viola jokes. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not um, going to make any viola yeah. jokes at all. My, where my issue would be is if you had been an accordion player. Uh, then, right, I then see. We, then, we, then, we, then we would have issues, you know. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, my, love yeah. the, my love for the accordion is is well documented. It's, <laughs> Well, I have to say, I do love the accordion, but the weird, oh, the weird for a weird reason. Oh, it's a weird reason. So, right. so I, so I, 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 I went to when I arrived in the UK to um, to marry husband number one. Actually, right. um, I, um, I decided I'm going to pursue this fascination with Indian classical music. So I went to right. the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, um, which has, you know, great, you know, performance um, opportunities as well as, you know, really fantastic academic work and and uh-huh. um and i just got really interested in the history behind these families of hereditary musicians uh-huh. who have passed on the tradition from father to son because it's a it, it was a very much a patriarchal tradition at the time sure. father uh-huh. to son down over the centuries down to the present day um and um what was really amazing was that they told two stories about their history the first was that 
Um, they all descend father to son in a direct line. Do not pass go to not collect 200 creds <laughs> um, from the period of the Emperor Akbar, the great Emperor Akbar, who right. was, you know, really tolerant to all religions and so on, um, who was the same time as Elizabeth I, so uh, right. 16th century. Um, but his great great grandson also banned music forever for, for 50 years. Um, and no music was allowed because he was a really strict Orthodox Muslim. Okay. Um, and the two stories can't work together because if you ban music for 50 years, you destroy the tradition completely because people mm -hmm. can't pass it on um, because yeah. it's not written down. And this is actually what the risk is in Afghanistan right now. Um, okay. And so I, I decided I was going to study the, the period of this emperor who banned music and find out what happened to music and you know that's the end of that but the reason of reason for the accordion <laughs> right. is that there's a really fantastic fantastic sufi genre called Havali, and some of you might be familiar with it um uh the great nusrat fatih ali khan from pakistan did a um, an album uh, with the real world label in the 80s i think with uh massive attack um and yeah. um and and the instrument that they use to accompany themselves is the harmonium, which right. some of you might be familiar with from, you know, maybe your your, your grandmother or your great grandmother had one um, to, to play hymns on or something like that. Okay. Um, and, but it's become an Indian instrument and it sounds right. very like the, the accordion. So I, too, was not an accordion lover. And through the Indian and Pakistani harmonium, I've just now love it so i'm sorry i'm just going to have to disagree with you on that right, well, well, well th thanks for being a guest on the podcast we'll just end it right there you know <laughs> 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 see ya <laughs> no no it's it's a it's a, a running joke here with uh, a number of people that i we, we did some stuff virtually over the pandemic and stuff in regards to musicians trying to, to meet yeah. up and uh yeah no there was a constant run of uh jokes around the accordion and stuff for me and i i actually implemented um a, a, an internet campaign called the northern ireland accordion protocol you know just in terms <laughs> of uh, um, <laughs> love it <laughs> so with a with a catchphrase of be a good ni custodian get rid of the accordion you know so it was, um, uh, <laughs> uh but no but in terms of you know I, I think in terms of you know obviously it's in jest and everything you know but uh there's definitely as a traditional instrument here you know the accordion is starting to the way in a bit in regards to you know it used to be a, a lot more prevalent especially in the marching bond scene yeah um than it is now i mean there's still a lot of bond, there are still a lot of bonds there but um yeah. the, the 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 flute and all that there's become the predominant kind yeah. of instrument in regards to marching bonds here yeah so you've, you've mentioned a wee bit about how you've ended up in this um you know southern asian music and history thing was it just that particular incident or that experience around you know the virtuosity of particular players that drew you into that or was there something else that, that was uh, instigated that love for this music or an interest there? Because as was saying to you before, but we kind of come on this, I mean, being a, a senior lecturer in South Asian music and history is hardly a childhood dream, is it? <laughs> no, no, I, I um, my, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer, actually, um, right. uh, you know, you know, all, all, all good middle class parents want their, want their children to, to, to do something like that. <laughs> um, but I always I always wanted, I always wanted something different and I always wanted something more. And I, and, um, and I just, you know, the, it, I mean, it, it really is the music that, that kind of, kind of took me, it, it took me away. It took me to right. a new place. Um, and here I was, you know, learning this and I, you know, I still love, you know, still love the Western tradition, still love jazz, still love bands, you know, all of that. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, you, you hear this sound and then you, you just think, this is really, really interesting. And there's lots, you know, you sort of hear things in common and things that are just not the same at all. Okay. Um, but I also, I also always wanted to travel. And I was always in, interested in um, Muslim culture, I, right, you know, okay. and, 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 and in particular the arts. So, so things like, you know, um, uh, textile design and, mm -hmm. you know, 
minarets and you know sort sure. of archways and you know beautiful calligraphy and and decoration mm -hmm. and um and I just found that you know it just I just found it endlessly fascinating and okay. but I'm I've always also always been interested in cultures where you actually have people from different communities quite different communities who um who sometimes don't get along very well okay um and thinking about those instances where they do actually um synthesize with each other and where where their lives seep into each other okay. and actually yeah. hindustani music or south asian you know indian classical music is one of those spaces because it's been dominated until the 20th century when it's switched by muslim musicians but okay. the vast number of the of the patrons were hindu and right, okay. they sing to you know hindu deities um, and I, you know, I just found this very interesting and it is one of those remaining spaces within Amazing. South Asian culture where, um, you know, and, uh, there's a, there's a space for peacemaking, there's right, okay. a space for love towards others and love beyond difference and a space for, um, enjoying difference rather than it having being something that divides. And I think that's something you know, probably somewhere deep in my my Quaker roots, my my I'm my, I'm 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 my I'm uh, Irish Quaker from uh, in background, um, uh -huh. but you know, via Australia, so a complete mongrel actually. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but 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 yes, yeah, so this is my you know, this is my my Irish Quaker you know, sort of peacemaker root sort of coming out in this really peculiar way and okay. i think once you once you've been working on uh you know on a culture like you know music and islam in south asia for as long as i have um uh -huh. it becomes endlessly fascinating it becomes another home um okay. uh yeah that that's a very long explanation for uh -huh. essentially it's about love i'm sorry uh -huh. no you're <laughs> all good i mean i, I think that it's it, when I, no no don't be apologies and i think it, it's um it's great because one of the things that I'm picking up on what you, you were saying there, Catherine, is, is it almost seems to break some of the stereotype that you might have around the, the particular cultures and stuff, you know, because yeah. you, you start talking about, you know, the Muslim culture. Arts aren't necessarily the thing that springs to mind, you know, Absolutely. in regards to, you know, and especially in regards to what may be presented on the, the media and so on. It almost seems that there's a very an anti arts, you know, kind of thing in yeah. specific areas. And, and here you're talking about a specific area that is definitely, you know, arts based on music based that causes, which may is a bit of a paradox, I think, whenever you think about yeah. the belief systems and so on, you know. So, well, it's an, it's an interesting thing in regards, to especially the peace building side of it, too. Yeah. And again, the stereotype in the media is that maybe Islam isn't the most peace building of religions or at least at least what we hear in the news seems to present that anyway you know and it's yeah. it's great to always get a a different perspective and i think from for me not just as a musician but also just in terms of what i do as a job i'm a, mm. I'm a restorative practitioner so being able to see beyond the issue or see above an issue and kind of look down at it from another perspective is always something that, that that's really useful to do and so on so yeah so what does what does being a, a senior lecturer in South Asian music and uh, history look like on a day to day basis for you? Do you have yeah. people banging the doors now to get into your classes? <laughs> I I so they are they are actually pretty popular, oddly. So um so I so um I I teach and I do research and I do administrative work. That's that's my day job. And okay. and teaching, I teach a wide range of things actually. So um one of my favorite things to teach is a course called Bollywood Sounds. Right. So, so I, I I teach the music of the Hindi film industry from the beginnings of sound cinema in 1931 right through to okay. the present day, and uh -huh. um, and make my students watch Bollywood films. And it's actually a really great way of of, of introducing people to a completely different culture in a in a uh -huh. in a fun way because sure. I have to explain, you know, at the beginning, um, you know. Often, if you've never seen a Bollywood film before, because there's all this, you know, song and dance and lots of melodrama mm -hmm. and so on, you 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 might, you, it's a really different aesthetic that you okay. might not get, and you need to realize that opera 
is a really different aesthetic for most people that most people um, don't get. And it's actually just a way of, you know, you, you just need to kind of get into it and, and start understanding uh, it and, you know, and, and just go with the groove basically. So that's one okay. thing I teach. I teach um, music and Muslim culture, South Asia, right. um, where we address not just music, but what um, Muslims might refer to as sound art or devotional art, because they have a very specific uh, interpretation of the word music, which we okay. should probably get onto because it has to do with why music is controversial in right. a number of Muslim societies, okay. most not notably the Taliban at the moment in Afghanistan. Um, and I teach um, global music history. Um, right. So we look at things like um, how the, uh, the, the, the lute so so anything from a guitar to a violin to an mm -hmm. uh, who or whatever you know sort of has come along the silk road from um from you know starting in um the the middle east and going to gandhara which is in afghanistan and across to china and then and also across to europe and the ways in which it's you know sort of become different mm -hmm. types of instruments and and you know we do you know bone flutes going back 50,000 years we do uh -huh. um you know the incas we, we do all sorts of things in that sure. um and in terms of my own research i'm currently finishing a book um which okay. looks at the um i am taking the stories of eight musicians from the period 1748 to 1858 which is the transition from um the Mughal Empire to the British Empire in India. And if you're okay. really interested in this period, there's a great new book out by William Dalrymple called The Anarchy, which um, which um, takes you through this period. It's an absolutely rip roaring adventure um, of how India moved from being ruled by this Central Asian Sunni Muslim dynasty uh -huh. um, to the British in less than 100 years. Right, okay. um, and and so I'm taking the, the stories of, of eight musicians, largely forgotten from this period, and looking at different types of writing about them um, that kept, cropped up in this period for some reason. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of writing on music in this period um, that nobody's really looked at before. And I'm working mostly in the Persian language, which is still right. spoken in Afghanistan and, of course, Iran, uh -huh. um, and Urdu and Hindi, which are the modern languages of, of India and Pakistan, um, and English, of course, because I'm dealing with the East India Company records. Sure. Um, and so so that's that, that's rather fun. Um, okay. And the, your your um, the the band listers will be interested to know that there's a um, there's an Urdu treatise from the middle of the 19th century which has these fantastic lithographs of um, a, a fife and drum uh, band. Um, right, okay. And um, so the East India Company and later the British Army trained uh, Indian musicians to. Um, perform as their band musicians and it's got instructions on how to do on the on the um the drum patterns for kvik march right <laughs> march right. quadrille because they because they also played for bat for um you know for uh balls and things um right, okay. and and it's and it's got in in um in nastalik script which is the arabic script above the the, the painting fife fife right. bu bugler drummer so to, okay. above the pictures of these things. So so you know there's a nice there's a nice connection there. So yeah, this, no, is, this is what I'm working on. Cool, that sounds good. No, it's amazing just yeah. for me, just where the the major tradition in terms of the marching bonds here in Northern Ireland, you know, pops up, you know, in regards to obviously there's a massive connection in terms of the British Army in regards yeah. to the development of the, the core of drums and uh I mean, I know that goes way back to the time of, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of uh, King, it's Henry the Eighth and stuff. There was the yeah. the, re uh, the restructuring of the the British Army, and he done that based on the Austrian uh, movement in regards to how there was troop movements, and it was the fife and drum that, that done the troop movements, and there was yeah. that, and then I think Queen Anne after King William the Third and Queen Mary did a restructuring again, and that became more to the fore. Um, again, in regards to the how the, mm. the troop movements were managed and stuff as well, and then that's obviously established itself as a tradition yeah. here in, in Northern Ireland due to obviously there's been a, a recruiting ground in terms of yeah. the, the British yeah. Army as well. You know, so it's interesting that it, it, it pops up all over the place. So one of the things that we we wanted to talk about is obviously in regards to 
I know the podcast is about positive stories, and I suppose yeah. um, when we're looking at the whole idea of what's happening in Afghanistan, you have to have been living under a rock if you're not, you know, aware of yeah. some of the, the issues that, that that are being faced there. Um, maybe you know, looking at it, we're not looking at it from a musician's point of view, but that's one of the things that we wanted to talk about here. Yeah, is that there's sp some specific issues around how musicians have been treated, how they're being treated in terms, and also the need for people to be who want to leave the country mm -hmm. um, in regards to the fact that obviously a Taliban have, have retaken control of, of the country. You were mentioning there something about the interpretation of the word music yeah. and that how that has an influence on how this is maybe being viewed and where this maybe impacts on the whole relationship that they have with musicians in Afghanistan. Yeah. Do you maybe want to go into that and then tell us yeah. a bit about what's going on there for musicians at the moment? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little, little bit of a frog in my throat. So, no, you're good. Um, so music um, means something slightly different in um, European languages to in Arabic, which of course is the la you know the language in in which you know Islam began, um, mm -hmm. and it actually comes from the same Greek root. So our word is music um, or, or musique if you're French. Um, their word for music is musique or musica. Um, okay. Same root, but it means really different things. So mu what we think of as music is basically anything that is what John Blacking, who taught at Queen's University Belfast, um, uh, but, you know, before he passed away many years ago, um, he he called it humanly organized sound. So, right. um, so you know, anything from a Beethoven symphony to something like John Cage's Four Minutes 33, because you're sitting there and you're listening yeah. to the sounds of nothing, or, but mm -hmm. it's not nothing. You're, you're hearing, you know, people coughing or sniffing yeah. or, you know, tapping their foot or whatever. And you hear that as music. And so that we might consider that to be music. Sure. In Islam, the word music is really restricted to secular genres. Okay. Um, that use melodic instruments so if you have you know somebody singing a song to a piano that would be that, that was you know just on you know i love my boyfriend that would be music right or music okay. um, and this is something that's not this this distinction is not well understood on either side of 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 the situation right so okay. there's so the recitation of the quran sharif the, the the holy book can be done using the classical arabic maqams of arab classical music music right. right but because it's the recitation of the quran and because it's not accompanied um, and it can be done in this incredibly beautiful molecular style which sounds like music to a european it's not mm -hmm. music it is absolutely not music because it is not secular music performed with musical inst melodic instruments right now okay. the reason for this um is so this this means that music is controversial in islam because music moves the emotions and it can move the emotions away from either your worldly duty or of course from the divine um mm -hmm. and so um and so it's placed under all sorts of restrictions including a large number of Muslims who um, believe that you shouldn't listen to musiki, that's um, secular music using instruments uh -huh. at all, but they listen to a whole range of other songs and, and yeah. you know, so on that, that, that in, on the European side we would actually consider music, right? Yeah. And this is not unfamiliar to those of us like me who grew up in Protestant communities where um where for example you might only sing metrical psalms you mm. know there are groups that where that only sing metrical psalms anything else as, aside from that is regarded as really you know um distracting from the word mm. of god right sure. so this is not unfamiliar territory we're talking about the taliban yeah. are different the taliban are different they they view all musical sound as morally corrupting right and all musicians as therefore morally degenerate. Right. So, and okay. particularly professional musicians, hereditary musicians. So these chains that I was talking about before uh -huh. and any musicians who've been exposed in the public. So anybody who's been on Afghan Idol <laughs> right. or anybody, anybody who's a you know pop star or anybody like the women of the Zohra Orchestra who have played 
you know, for international audiences and have videos wow. of them with their faces uncovered. And, you know, that that's regarded as absolute anathema. Those people are regarded as morally degenerate and therefore okay. needing punishment. Um, now, this is this is not a, this is not a mainstream view um, yeah. uh, in, in Islam at all. Um, they really are right up the far end of what they will okay. tolerate. So no audible music, no live music. And that means the musicians of Afghanistan, the professional musicians, the hereditary musicians, those who've been exposed in the media are highly endangered now. Right, okay. And they also can't work. So, you know, they've been, they don't have other professions they can turn to in order to, in order to make a living. They can't right. work. Um, okay. And they're now going to be going into a, a, a situation where more than half of the population will be starving this winter. Right. Um, unless the world helps with famine relief. So, okay. so it's an it's not a good situation, right? Okay, you know, and I, I suppose that's that's really useful. I, even I, I suppose for myself that that demarcation in terms of you know how music is viewed, and I suppose that provides some level of a rationale, you know, in regards to what what you may be seeing and what you what you're hearing and so on, and a, yeah. that connection between musical instruments being almost morally degenerate. And again, and like you say, you know, there are elements of that. You were talking about the more traditional orthodox kind of christian thing but that that, that that approach still finds itself even in the the more modern strands of christianity and the charismatic yeah. realm you know the there's a whole contemporary christian music movement that's been there for the last 35 40 years or so that has yeah. raised the debate around you know this is secular no it's not the the the, the, the lyrical content is spiritual so it doesn't matter what form it takes and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's um, a, I suppose it's a, it's an ancient debate and an issue that we've been been going through as music has evolved and and developed yeah. over the years and stuff. So obviously, as a result of this, you know, I've got musician, musicians here in a position where they've been they're publicly known. They can't get all their work. Their lives are under threat. Then is that? Is that a for a yes. assumption to say their lives are under threat then? Yes. Yes. So there have been executions um, right. of uh, musicians. So the first was Fawad Andorabi, a folk musician close to Kabul uh, on the 27th of August. So really very soon after the, right, the, okay. they marched the in. Takeover. Okay. Um, yeah, there's the um, one musician from Barakshan a few weeks ago was killed fleeing the Taliban and was shot by Iranian border guards. Several musicians and listeners were shot and killed at a wedding um, a, a couple of weeks ago. And last week, um, there were reports um, of a 19-year-old a boy who was killed simply for listening to music on his phone. Oh. Now, um, the, the I mean, this, these these stories there are there are so many of them, and and you know we're hearing stories of of beatings. Um, musicians are um, destroying their instruments. I mean, the the, the worst story. One of the, well, not the worst, but. You know what musicians are like with their instruments. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so one musician who I'm in contact with um, on a regular basis lives in a very high flat um, and had a you know a set of really beautiful instruments, including a harmonium right. <laughs> um, that had been yeah. given to him by friends in India and who which he really really treasured. And he realised that you know because he was specifically targeted, the Taliban know who he is. Right. Um, he was going to have to destroy his instruments. And so he destroyed his instruments, but then realized he had no way of getting rid of them. And it turns out that that uh, electronic keyboard keys and harmonium keys don't destroy very easily. Right, okay. um, so so it's, a, it's a slightly, sort of slightly funny yeah. story in a way, but but, sure. but he, uh -huh. he started panicking because there was a checkpoint right outside the door, the front door of the apartment complex. Uh -huh. And they were checking everybody's bags. So he couldn't take them out in bags. Right. And he couldn't burn them because, um, you know, because the Taliban wouldn't notice and all the fire alarms would go off yeah. and notice that somebody was trying to burn something. So uh -huh. he's sitting there in his apartment in amidst the ruins of his beloved instruments, not knowing what to do with the body, basically. 
Uh-huh. I mean, it's just the most heart-rending stories like this that are coming out. There's also great stories. So uh-huh. um, there's one particular woman, um, young woman, teenager, who um, who was part of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music and the Zohra Orchestra, who you may have heard sure. about. And yeah. for all of your listeners, there's a good news story there too. Um, all of them have actually made their way out to a third country now right. where they're That's awaiting processing for, um, for evacuation to um, uh, another European country, not the UK, but another European okay. country. So that's really good news. But this girl, um, she heard that the, the, the Taliban had taken over and she got her mother and her sister, just three women are traveling on their own. And she bribed a truck driver who does the regular route uh-huh. um, across the border to Pakistan to put them in the back of his lorry. Um, and they hid in barrels, empty barrels that were in the back of his lorry. Um, right. And he got them over the border into Pakistan, where they walked into a, a mosque. And this old imam basically said, "Yes, you can stay as long as you need to stay in the in the mosque." Right. So, so this is this you know really extraordinary yeah. story of of great courage and 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 so on. So you know, so there's there's, there's good stories, but it's also it is also true that ninety nine percent of the musicians in Afghanistan are still stuck there um, in great danger. Um, including all of the master musicians. So, you know, you're, you're thinking the, the the James Galways, the, sure. you know, the, the you know, you two, you, you know, it, it, it's, they're the ones who are still stuck. Right, okay. You know, um, I, I think that's, that's hard for, I think that's hard for me. I'm just, I'm sitting here listening to you talking, Catherine, and it's, I'm, I'm having a hard time, you know, reconciling the whole idea of being a musician and being in danger yeah. just because I am a musician. And yes. and, and that that's that's when I has to say that weighs a wee bit heavy on, yeah. on my heart a wee bit in regards, to, you know, that you know, what would I you know, when I think about the, the even the, some of the guitars and stuff that I have and the yeah. thought of having to sit in my living room and smash those things up just yeah. for the possibility of staying alive. Yeah, it is. It's just hard. Yeah, that's, that's that's heavy stuff. Yeah, it is. It is really heavy, and it's actually, you know, why I'm doing this. Why I'm 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 helping. I'm an academic. It, it, it's not actually my job to be, you know, trying to assist musicians in danger. Um, uh, but I would never forgive myself if I didn't, um, because mm-hmm. because I am in a position where. I am actually an expert on the subject, mm-hmm. um, at least from a theoretical point of view um, sure. and a historical point of view. And I am at a stage in my career where I have the kinds of contacts where I can try to make a difference. Mm-hmm. And if I didn't do it, I wouldn't forgive myself because if I were born in Afghanistan through an accident of chance, I would be in exactly the same position as them. Mm-hmm. And I think all of us would be. But one thing that actually that people can do, which the musicians are really moved by, is just offer their solidarity. Um, mm. And we've been saying this all along, you know, the last three months. It's three months now. Um, it feels like a lifetime. I'm a completely different person now, actually, sure. I think. Um, is, is that the musicians really appreciate hearing that people have um have have been thinking about them have been you know sort yeah. of raising money for them have been acting on their behalf have been each, just just thinking about them so so yeah. my my I, i'm not terribly religious but my my parents are religious and and they've been praying for them and they really uh-huh. my musicians really really appreciate the fact that my parents yeah. have, have been praying for them even though my parents are christians and they're muslims that doesn't make yeah. a difference sure. you know they believe we all worship the same god and so um you know that that's solidarity is not nothing it's really okay. something okay um and one of the things that the musicians union has 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 offered is is if any of these musicians get to um the the uk um that they will um offer them a membership um straight off the plane okay. uh, of the musicians union so the, again you know unions are good with solidarity um yeah. Yeah, that, but there are other things that people can do. Okay, and in terms of what's you know the 
let, let's let's talk about that then. Let, let's kind of talk about what the the practicalities are. What are sure. what are the needs, and what can yeah. we potentially do? Yeah. So, um, so the, I mean, the, the the immediate needs right now have to do with um, uh, them not starving over the winter or freezing to okay. death. Um, and you've probably all seen this. Go to the World Food Program site and click on their link to Afghanistan for the most up to date details. Um, they are estimating that 23 million people will starve over the winter in Afghanistan unless there is a great deal more help. Mm. We are about to start fundraising um, specifically with the funds to be going to musicians. So there okay. will be a concert on the 11th of December, which will be um, both online and in person. And if anybody in Northern Ireland wanted to put on a concert on the 11th of December um, and to hook into this, um, okay. you know, you can just get in, in touch. Um, uh, it's um, afghan.musician. Oh, actually, I'm not entirely sure what my proton mail um, <laughs> email right, is. Okay. You can find me at King's College London in the music department, Catherine Schofield. <laughs> That's the easiest okay. way to find me. No so, um, so, um, so we're going to, we're going to start, um, fundraising specifically for the musicians who are on our list and we've got quite a large list now and we're now coordinating um, uh, across the world um, particularly with the anglophone world um, so US Canada Australia New Zealand um, Ireland uh, and you know the UK of course um, and we're also um, coordinating um, on, on with the um, continental Europe as well, um, slightly different set of issues there. Um, so we we have verified lists of people who are in the most need um, for, for that. And so we'll be sending that via legal registered charities who are working on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, okay. So, but, but actually just general giving um, to any charity which um, is a, as a reliable charity. So, um, uh, all these, all of these charities are on the ground. Red Cross, uh, Save the Children, UNICEF, World Food Program. You can give directly to um, Afghan Aid. Um, there are a number of them um, who are um, in, uh, what, uh, the International Rescue Committee who are in Afghanistan um, and who are also actually helping um, refugees in Pakistan. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, Afghan refugees there. So so that's that's something that people can do. Um, oh. Another thing that people can do is um, support our campaign um, to get the Home Office and other governments around the world to recognize that musicians under the Taliban are what is called in the language of the 1951 Refugee Convention, members of a particular social group with a well-founded fear of persecution. Okay. So musicians are targeted because they're musicians. And sure. not for not for any other characteristic. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what kind of music you play, whether it's Western or Afghan, or whether you're a man or a woman, or whether your lyrics are political, or you're just playing the rhubarb. It, it's the sound of music itself which is a threat, and therefore it's all musicians who are targeted because they're musicians. So that's that. And to get the UK Home Office to open up the ACRS scheme and put musicians on there as a priority. So, okay. um, so it's a small group of people. Um, sure. But the other thing is, is that there is a really fantastic resettlement scheme, which is being um, devised in Northern Ireland um, okay. by um, uh, a local charity, Beyond Skin. Um, which is whose CEO is Darren Ferguson, and who some some people in the the band community will know well, um, yeah. and um, and it's the most fantastic scheme, which we're actually hoping will be a model for for other schemes. But again, it's getting the Home Office to say yes um, to yeah. this. So, yeah, well, and for people who may not know, what is the ACRS scheme? You know, what is that? I am sorry. <laughs> It's all these, all, all these, all these acronyms. So yeah. the ACRS scheme is the Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme, and it's essentially designed for groups of vulnerable Afghans who don't, who didn't necessarily work for the UK military or government. So the the ones who d were directly funded by the UK are eligible for what's called the ARAP scheme, which is mm -hmm. the uh, I can't remember what it is, but that's the one that the the, the translators and people who assisted the military. Um, 
came okay. uh, ca are coming out under. ACRS is the separate scheme for groups of vulnerable Afghans um, who did not necessarily work for the British government or the or the British army. Okay, so one of the things that we could potentially do as well is we could maybe petition our own local politicians to exert their influence to say this is something as musicians we would feel strongly about. And if you could, you know, pop a letter or even say something about this, that would be be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Yes. Anything that will will get. And this is the really great thing about Northern Ireland as a community as well. It's a it's it's a it's a small geographical area. You know your MPs. You know your MLAs. Um, to, yeah. If you if you can get your M MPs to raise a question in the House of Commons to say, um, why are you not prioritising musicians for um, ACRS for for, yeah. for resettlement in the in in the UK? Given they're so endangered, yeah. um, you know it is something that. So we have we have put two letters through to the government. Um, one went directly to the Prime Minister and it was a private letter. The other one went to was published in the Sunday Times on the 3rd of October. Um, and both of those had really big names from the music industry. So okay. Simon Rattle, um, Dame Evelyn Glennie, um, Nitin Sawney, Peter Gabriel, um, and really strong representation from Northern Ireland. Okay. On both well, of those letters, um, for, so the the you know the arts charities, the the, the organisations, a number of the politicians, and a large number of civil society organisations, really really behind this um, yeah. this idea of getting musicians and artists at risk yeah. to resettle in Northern Ireland, where they can continue to practice their traditional. Um, arts in the new unesco city of culture music. yeah city absolutely. of music i mean yeah. just, which is just that just delights me that that, that yeah. this is this honor has been given to belfast because it's it's so true yeah and i think one of the things that, that that's that's evident here or, or prominent for me in terms of my own thoughts and stuff Catherine, is you know I'm going. I'm. This is going to go out as a, a bonus episode for me, and uh, in terms of me to pray, but it, just in terms of reaching out to the members of the bond community here, mm. guys, we know what it's like. You know, to feel like your your culture is under threat, and feel like you know that 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 what you do and what you believe in, and the music the music that you play, can sometimes be seen as offensive to people, and we know how that makes us feel. We know how that kind of draws a, a, it's a rallying call for us to kind of, you know, protect our culture and to be seen as, you know, we're musicians first and foremost, folks, you know, and that's something that I know that I've spoken a lot about on the podcast is that first and foremost, we're musicians. Yeah. And, you know, guys, if we, if we can provide some level of support, even if it is just a message of support from your bond to say that we're behind the musicians from Afghanistan, and we definitely feel that they should be protected. You know, think about it from our perspective. Think about it, you know, if we felt that, you know, we had to go underground for playing our music and that, that our our way of life was, or even our life was under threat because we were members of bonds, what would we want to do? What would we, would we want people to come to our aid? We definitely would. And there's yeah. an opportunity for us here in the bond scene in Northern Ireland to show our solidarity with musicians yeah. across the world and to say that how they're being treated is not right and that we're behind any scheme that protects their lives, folks. So whatever way that looks, then let, let's do something about it, guys. All right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually really moved by, by what you just said because I think... I think this is vital. We are all, we're all musicians. We know what music means to us. We know what music means to our communities too and how important it is. It's really interesting. I was listening to Lise Doucette's um, Voice for Afghanistan. She's got a series of podcasts on the BBC Sounds app. Mm -hmm. um, and she um, she spoke to a number of Afghans about their wish. It's No, it's a wish for Afghanistan. Sorry, that's the name of the podcast. It's a wish for Afghanistan. And what their wishes are, is it, it's 10 podcasts and some of them were actually recorded before um just before the fall um of Kabul and some after and there are there is an episode on, on music but I was really struck by the one where she interviews um the chair of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission who is not a musician and one mm -hmm. of the things she said that moved her the most 
and and in in this period after the fall, she's been watching and listening to videos of the Zohra Orchestra, these young women, and thinking, this is the soul of Afghanistan. This is this is this is this the beautiful you know sort of pure center of 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 of, mm-hmm. of the culture, and it's and this has been taken away, and these people's lives have been you know sort of taken um not not metaphorically and and in a situation where they're you know people's lives are actually being taken i it, it's probably wrong to even speak metaphorically like that but but it was really interesting to me that it was the music that was so important to her such yeah. an important symbol of hope um and of loss um and the it is nobody should underestimate how powerful solidarity can be with our fellow musicians yeah. and that we are we are musicians first and foremost we know what it's like when when we can't play or we're stopped from playing or tell somebody tells us to shut up or um and and for our communities as well I, you know it is yeah i'm, I'm just really moved <laughs> oh it, the, the, for me it's been you know that's been the, the one of the things that i've been really you know trying to do with the podcast in regards obviously there's a political scenario here in regards to how some yeah. music is viewed and stuff like that and you know and that's why i was really interested in what you were saying around that the the paradox and that you know sort of asian music where on one hand it's actually seen as maybe divisive but yet in another part of it it's actually it's bringing two completely opposing view yeah. world viewpoints almost together and stuff yeah. you know and i think that there's you know there's a, there's a tremendous power in music but i, I just i think for me one of the things that, that I've, I've talked a lot about with people over the last few while well is that understanding is better than knowledge you know being able yes. to understand what's going on and really what's underneath things is so much better yeah. than what you think you might know about this scenario yeah and you know and and I suppose what we get from the news and what we get from other sources and stuff doesn't really scratch the surface as to what's the what's going on. It's the personal story, it's the human story that you know that really goes, here's what's really happening. And if we could put ourselves in that person's shoes to say, you know what, as a member of a flute band, try and put yourself in a position where if you walk out onto the street in your uniform and you play your flute, you're gonna get killed. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's yeah yeah that's i mean that's yeah. the reality of that's the reality of yeah. the scenario that these these musicians are, are living in and yeah go on I'm, I'm knocking stuff over and all here um yeah yeah no it's i mean it really is and and yet there are musicians who are still in afghanistan and who are who are still actually um, creating recordings as a mode of resistance. Um, right, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find some, Glenn, and then sh- and share them with you, and perhaps you yeah. can share them with the community. Yeah, because... no worries. I mean, I, that that would be great. I mean, I think you know anything. You know that that sure that there's a, you know that people are are finding ways to adapt, and it's amazing just yeah. how much resilience can form in, in terms of hum- humanity, in terms of being yeah. faced with some of the most drastic scenarios, and and, yeah. spe- and we're. And I definitely think that the soul of that comes from music. I think that there's a yeah. resilience that comes from being a musician that goes sometimes, you know, a wee bit maybe deeper than just maybe a violent response. I mean, the natural yeah. response is a violent response, you know, in terms of yeah. outrage. But whenever you can't do that, where do you go? Because the idea of of you up if you were to raise yourself up in a violent manner, especially in Afghanistan, yeah. you're going to be met with extreme violence back. You know, yeah. so it's not even an option, you know, and this idea of trying to do something that's linked to your soul, the music and doing that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and even then, by even doing that, that, given what you were telling us about, you know, how music is viewed and so on and, and to be using this as a means of resistance is, is, is quite poignant as well. Isn't yeah, it, you know? so, it is. It's it's really powerful. And and actually, so I was just thinking there is probably something else that, that people in the band community can do, um, which is that... Um, there are, you know, the the UK Westminster government are currently parceling out refugees to various parts of these isles, including Northern Ireland. Um, and so there will be Afghan refugees, traumatised Afghan refugees who will be um, com- coming to, to Belfast soon. And some are already there um, and other parts of Northern Ireland. Um, and um, 
the most of them were uh, extremely high educated um you know c- civil society um uh military interpreters so on um a lot of them are going to be really missing the music of their homeland mm. right. a lot of them are actually going to be really good amateur musicians and if there's actually a way to maybe you know get some if you've got some spare instruments perhaps donating them i don't know how this might work yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, but getting instruments into people's hands so that they can actually play themselves um you know maybe even providing spaces um for, for them to for, practice for, or play yeah, or something like that there, to, yeah. to, to practice or play you know just really these are really simple practical yeah. things that 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 we can do just to an extend a hand yeah. and say you know if you want to sing here's a space they all sing yeah. they yeah. and they, and and yeah go online and and find some afghan ghazal singers um and again i'll i'll share some share some clips they've got there's you know, some really beautiful songs okay. which of course we won't understand because they're in yeah the yeah well, that's, that's, <laughs> but I mean, that, that's sometimes you don't need the words you know sometimes no, all exactly. you need to hear what's going on and you know and and music affects you and yeah. if, if anything the music that i'm involved in doesn't have words you know we're, yeah. we're just you know in terms of you know it's melodies and stuff obviously from songs that do have words but we, we're not running about singing or yeah. doing anything so you know um i think that that's there was something else that i was i was gonna i was gonna mention there and i'm just kind of my, my mind is just kind of taken with the the thought of what we could potentially be doing the other thing that, that comes to mind is that for a long period of time darn and the guys at beyond skin had been linking um musicians from mm. the marching bonds here with musicians from other countries other cultures and so on yeah and to great effect you know i know i was involved in a number of, the, of those um I, one of my poignant musical memories is having a lo- a loyalist flute band playing in a methodist church with a sri lankan beatboxer oh, a wow. norwegian a norwegian bass player a colombian flute flute player playing a german beer barrel polka <laughs> that's awesome i love um, that yeah and you know just in terms of even things like that there you know are just you know yeah. the, the options of just you know marrying the the culture together and stuff and darn's been very good at that you know in terms of branching out and then we had the marching metal thing that we did not that long ago where we had you know a couple of flute players doing sort of traditional um tunes but in a in a heavy metal kind of style as well you I know in it. terms of you know which was which went down on absolute trade as well so there maybe there's something there for for darn and myself to maybe have a chat about and seeing if we can't you know get um the gala around that and especially yeah. uh, maybe even linking an accordion bond or something together with you know yeah. these, the harmonium players oh and yeah stuff get, like get, get about, them some know. harmoniums get 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 your granny yeah. to give them <laughs> give them, give them out and stuff yeah, <laughs> yeah. so get there's them, nobody them off. so there's definitely options for us to be involved in terms of making a difference in um these musicians lives and stuff you know i think it would be it would be great to have that level of you know contact from the the marching bonds here to be able to even if it is just solidarity it is a place to practice there is something that they small that we can do that yeah. says that we're we're behind these musicians. That would be, yeah. I think, that would be amazing, and so on. You know, so absolutely, Catherine. Is there anything else that you want to, you know, just share with us in in terms of, you know, that you feel is important? And I know maybe one of the things yeah. you could do is forward some of those uh, addresses and web addresses and things, and we'll put them in the the program notes for this year, so that yeah. people can kind of get in yeah. touch with those places. But is there anything else you want to share with us, just as we we we, we finish off? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is that um, this is this is about this is about giving a little bit of life and a little bit of hope and a little bit of your heart um, when, you know, th- there are so many things that divide us um, in 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 modern life and and in our politics and in terms of, you know, sort of race issues and all sorts of things but at the end of the day at the bottom of it all we're all human beings all of us Mm -hmm. and in this case we're all musicians um and just you know just 
you know, giving a, a, a little bit, a little bit of love, a little bit of your heart, you know, to, to, to people who would do the same for us, actually, mm. if we were in this, if we were in their shoes, it could so easily be us. Um, and I mean, that's, that's, that's really my plea, but, but also, you know, I just, I want to give my, you know, sort of, uh, you know, love and solidarity to you as well. Um, and all your performances and, and, um, you know, all of your musical activities as a community, because, you know, it's, it's actually through those, you know, that solidarity, that care, giving a little bit of heart that, you know, that makes this world a better place. And there's so much negative and there is so much mm. bad, but there are things that we can do to make things a little bit better around us and for other yeah. people. So. No, so true. So true. Um, Catherine, I want to just say thank you for taking the time out to come on and uh, be on the Made the Parade podcast with me. Absolutely fantastic. And it's great for us to kind of branch out and, you know, go international again, you know, in regards to, you know, trying to find a way of helping um, fellow musicians uh, yeah. if we can. So thank you for one, being on, two, for just sharing some um, knowledge and helping us understand maybe the situation a bit better as well. I think I've, I found that really enlightening. Uh, and then just for some of the practicalities in terms of what we potentially could do Yes. Um, you know that um, to help people out and stuff is it, fantastic. So, thank you, thank you so much for 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 taking the time out to be with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Glenn. It's been an absolute pleasure. So there you go, folks. There's a lot there for us to be to be thinking about. You know, and as I said earlier on in in that podcast, that there, if we were to think about this from our perspective as members of March and Pons, and to think that we were under that kind of threat then you know there was things we would be looking people to help us out we would be doing all we could to, to make sure that we protected ourselves and, and done things for other for other people so folks we will put the the addresses up at the end of this um episode and uh please by all means whatever we can do as uh, a march and bond community to help let let let's do that okay so thanks very much folks for taking the time to to, to watch this particular episode and as always, look after yourselves and take it easy. You have been listening to the Made to Parade podcast, sponsored by the British Drum Company, where Phantom, Regimental Series and Axial Parade Drums are hand-built in the UK to look amazing, sound amazing and feel amazing. <laughs>